Jason Schaefer are going to share with you some of the things that they've done to become, I believe, the first retailer to do an IPO in quite a while. So, Tony? Thank you, Mark. <laughs> well, this isn't going to be as exciting as social media. It's kind of, we're going to do a little blocking and tackling, I think, today and talk a little bit about inventory. Um, let me give you, uh, well, first I got to do the, uh... there we go, safe harbor, everybody's seen that, now we can move on. All right. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, the vitamin shop. Um, it's, it's kind of an interesting retailer, probably a lot of people in the audience have not heard of the vitamin shop, but uh, it's a health and wellness retailer. Uh, we have uh, 450 stores in 37 states across the United States and people go, wow, that's, I didn't realize, I didn't, didn't realize you were that big. We have about, uh, our stores are about 3,500 square feet. We have about 8,000 SKUs in each of the stores. And uh, we've had positive comps for the last three years. In the fourth quarter of last year, we had a 7% comp. And a lot of the performance of the business has been really driven by uh, some of the stuff we've done in inventory, managing our in stocks and managing the SKU count that we have. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. To set the stage a little bit, back in uh, 2006 when I joined the Vitamin Shop, uh, they were owned by Irving Place Capital, which is a private equity group. Uh, they'd been into this business for four years and they were struggling uh, to get sales growth out of the business. Uh, they wanted to accelerate the growth of the company and build more stores, but they had to improve the performance of the business. Our in stocks for the company were around 85%. That's customer facing in stock. Our direct back order for our internet and catalog business was 20%. It was abysmal. We had all the wrong inventory in all the wrong places, and for three years in a row, we hadn't been able to get over 2.8 to 2.9 turns of our inventory. It was, a, it was a tough position for the company to, to be in. And we looked at our supply chain. We had one DC that was servicing, at that time, about 230 stores, and we weren't sure about the capacity of that DC long term. And this is a bit of a, in the sports nutrition side of the business, it's a bit of a fashion business. You've got to get into products. When Oprah Winfrey talks about a side juice, if we can't be there tomorrow, we're in trouble. We're going to miss that opportunity. So we had to be fast to market. So we looked at all these business challenges, and we, what did we say? You know, what does good look like? What did we want to be when we grow up and we're a, a billion-dollar company, retail company? We wanted to improve our in-stocks to 97%. We wanted our direct back order to be world-class around 2%. We wanted to improve our inventory productivity. In the short term, we wanted to see if we could get the four turns of our inventory. And we wanted to lower our cycle times to our stores. If you think about it, we had stores in Hawaii, and we were servicing them from North Bergen. So if we could take a day out of the lead time or two days out of the lead time, that was a huge, huge opportunity, both for inventory productivity and in-stock for us. And we had to develop the alignment and the organizational structure to support uh, the goals that we had for success. So how did we approach the inventory challenge? Well, we looked at a couple of things. We looked at the system side of the business and we tried to understand, could we use the current system that we had? Did we have to go out and install a new replenishment system? Or was there some other alternative that we could use? Uh, we had a small IT group of about 40 people, so we didn't have a lot of resources in this company. At the time, it was probably $300 million in sales. And we had to look at the people. Did I have the right people for you know, a billion and a half dollar organization? Did we need some more people along the way? What was the talent level that we currently had and how did we change the talent level? And then we had to look at the operations. And that's really about the process side of the business. What, you know, we could put in a new system, but if we didn't change our processes and what we were doing to, to begin with, this was a family run company. Uh, they had done a lot of things with band-aids and uh, rubber bands along the way to get to where they got to. Um, so we had to look at the processes. And the last thing that we had to look at, which is really interesting, most retailers don't spend a lot of time thinking about this, but it's inventory accuracy. And what I mean by inventory accuracy is how many of the SKUs in the store actually match the systems on hand? What is that percentage? At the time, we had uh, stores that were running 60, 70% inventory accuracy. 
and we had to get that number up. I think there's a number of studies that have been done by a bunch of different institutions, Harvard and Princeton, that said, you know, if you can get to 85 to 90 percent inventory accuracy at your store, your replenishment system is going to run much better. So we undertook a, a cultural change in our stores to get the stores focused on making sure their inventory accuracy was correct through a number of process changes along the way. So this gives you kind of a framework about how we thought about the problem, how we're going to go after the problem. At this point in time, I'd like to bring Jason Sheffer up. And Jason's our director of inventory and replenishment. Jason is the guy that was responsible for a number of changes that we put in place after we developed the strategy. So I'll let Jason take it over. Thank you, Tony. So as we, as we began, we started looking at our inventory system options, and we really broke it into four different options. We can continue doing status quo, so what we had been doing previously, which was utilizing our current system for replenishment. And what this meant was we had fixed min-maxes that weren't very dynamic around sales or changing supply chain patterns out in our stores. And for ordering from our vendors, it meant using basic weeks of supply logic to, make to fill the DC that wasn't always connected with the amount of inventory that we needed out in the stores. And, we, did, and as we, we talked more and more about this, it obviously wasn't meeting the expectations that we wanted as a business. The second option we looked at was to modify the current system's replenishment module. So we could take the existing system that we had today and begin to modify it and try to make it what we wanted, but we felt that that came along with way too much risk because as you go into modify a system, you often end up uh, with inadvertent results or, or things that you didn't expect happening uh, that are tied together in the system it, uh, as you begin to change things. The third piece that we looked at was implementing our traditional replenishment system. And as we looked at our business and what we needed to happen, we just felt that this wasn't a fit for us. We didn't have the right resources across the business in the inventory management team or in IT to be able to support a traditional replenishment system, nor did we have the money to be able to implement a traditional replenishment system. We also wanted to find a solution that we were going to be able to put in very quickly and be able to drive results fast. And putting a traditional replenishment system in it often takes a year or two years to get the system in and tune it to get the results that you actually want as a business. So the fourth option that we began to look at, which was new to us at a vitamin shop, and we hadn't really talked about this much, was an outsourced replenishment model. And as we started to talk about this, uh, a partner came in mind uh, around 4R uh, because of an internal resource that had worked with them previously. So I'll take just a couple minutes and tell everybody a little bit about who 4R is. They work with a variety of retail clients from staple items, much like the vitamin shop, to short-lived fashion items. And, and I mentioned that they're an outsourced replenishment model. And what that means is each week, we take our key data in the system, our sales and our margin data and our inventory position, and we feed that over to the 4R team, who then optimizes all of that information and sends us back the optimal inventory levels for our DC and store, which we then plug into our ERP system. Our ERP system then acts as a giant calculator uh, to make sure that we're generating the right orders and allocating the right inventory out to the stores to meet the settings that the 4R team has sent back to us. I mentioned DC and store replenishment. 4R also does promotion and markdown optimization uh, as well, and at the vitamin shop, we're using DC store and promotion optimization right now. So I mentioned um, that 4R sends back to us the optimal inventory levels. The way they do this is through what they call profit optimized inventory. And ultimately what this is, is each week when we send over their data for every store SKU combination, they look for the lowest cost or the highest profit model for us. And what that means is um, carrying the right amount of inventory but not too much based on our inventory carrying cost versus the offset of, of lost sales. So if you think about a traditional replenishment model, ultimately what it asks you to do is set a service level and you're often thinking to yourself, what's the right service level to have the lowest amount of inventory but capture the most sales? So that's what this model actually does. It actually does that. It doesn't ask you to set a target service level. It actually goes out based on the sales margin data that you have as well as the inventory carrying cost inputs that we provide and gives us our highest profitability solution. And we'll talk a little bit about what that's done for us here as we get into our results. 
So what we did at the vitamin shop, once we decided that 4R was something that we wanted to, wanted to look at further, is we put together a pilot program. And I would, I would certainly recommend this for anybody who's doing 4R or any other replenishment system. And our program included 30 stores. And it was a mix of high volume, low volume, average volume stores, and even some of our New York City small format stores. And our focus was on getting the right depth of inventory in the stores. We weren't focused on changing the assortment, so we, didn't, we were still letting our category managers select the right assortment or, or the assortment that they wanted in the stores. We just wanted to make sure that we had the, the right depth of product. And then we prepared our stores for what was going to happen to them as we began to put a new replenishment system in place. At the time, we didn't have planograms. So it was really up to our stores to kind of lay the store out the way that they felt was best. We had sections, but on an individual section, if we had a depth of five of a particular SKU, we began giving them guidance around whether they should go five deep on the shelf or if they should go a couple units deep break and then have a second facing. The, the next key piece around the pilot is we established some measurement criteria. So we established control stores for all of the stores that we were piloting. And these were like stores in terms of demographics and location and so forth. And we developed an agreed upon measurement template that we issued weekly to the business with key metrics such as sales dollars, margin dollars, margin percent, inventory dollars, um, in stock, average units per transaction, everything you would want to know about the business. We want to make sure we were capturing so we could see what was happening in these set of stores. And for us, it was critical that we and the inventory team didn't develop the template. It was developed by finance, who was really an independent third party who didn't have skin in the game. So each week they were able to report out to the business and it wasn't as though we were, we were looking at the numbers in a favorable way or 4R was presenting the numbers in a more favorable way than, than uh, what we should be in terms of a business. They were, they were really an independent third party. And, and where that really helped us is, is we began to report some of the results and I know these are some general bullets and we're just not able to share some of the real deep specifics around this. Um, but we realized significant sales growth in the pilot stores and they also contributed a lot more margin to our business. So we began sharing those results with the business and because finance was saying it, it carried so much more weight in the, in the business. We reduced out of stocks by more than 40% which we believe was one of the, the key things that drove the sales and we saw a number of the other metrics that we were looking at around units per transaction, average ticket and so forth increase. The challenge for us as we looked at this project and we went through the pilot was really what we termed as the bubble. The bubble was, was the fact that as we looked at our business, we realized that we probably had the right aggregate amount of inventory, but we had all the wrong inventory in the wrong places. So I had too much in the DC, I had too much in some stores, not enough. So we had to go fix all that. And buying the extra inventory to fill in for the increases that we needed was easy. All I needed to do was hit the buy button and flush that out to the stores. The hard part was getting rid of all the inventory that needed to go away and getting it rebalanced throughout the chain. So as we put all of this into kind of our financial model, including all of the distribution and transportation costs to send all of the incremental units out, we, we calculated a payback of, of less than two years and that, would, that was really our finance team using that model which was probably a, a, a stricter version of, of what we would have used because it fully burdened the inventory cost and so forth. So if you would have used inventory carrying cost and so forth, we think we would have seen a payback actually more in the, in the range of a year or even, even potentially faster than that. So with those results, we decided to, to move forward and do a rollout to our entire business. We focused on it by product category to limit the disruption for the store. So we chunked our stores into three or four different categories and we rolled, we rolled those categories one at a time. And we had several go, no-go decision points throughout the process. So at each point we would roll a category and then we would go back to the executive team and share what was happening in terms of the sales performance. Were, were we getting the sales performance and was inventory trending the way we thought it was going to trend as we saw it during the pilot and then we received approval from, from the executive team to continue forward with the project throughout there. 
Another very important point to note is I've talked a lot about the stores so far is while we were doing this, we also rolled out the DC parameters. 